Uh, yeah, yeah, don't walk too much. Squeaky. Okay. Uh, ska jag börja på engelska eller svenska? Uh, kanske börja på svenska. Eller, I'll start in English anyway. So welcome everyone to this talk by uh, Volt Muscarella. And this is part of the Upplands Botaniska Förening um, seminar series, or whatever you can call it. And my name is Linus. I'm part of the board uh, of Upplands Botaniska Förening. And I'm also a colleague of Bob. Uh, and you've been here in Uppsala since 2019. That's right. Yeah. And you, you work mainly with uh, tropical ecology. Yeah. Um, did you also do your PhD thesis and all of that in Puerto Rico? or? Uh, I did it in New York, but on research that also in Puerto Rico. Yeah. So you have quite yeah. a long like history with Puerto Rico. Yeah. Now, yeah. So uh, I'll talk about some of that today, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's okay. it's been an adventure being there. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, so we're very happy to have Bob here, and especially in like times like these, and uh, in Sweden with seasons like this, it's very nice to go to somewhere that looks like this. Uh, so please, very welcome, Bob. Thanks, Linus. Um, we're just opening the third jar of honey yeah. from your dad. So they, we ha we I forgot it in the office, and it, so we had to get some other honey, and the kids are like refusing it. So, yeah, from this year we're already in the third one because his dad is making honey from the wild bees that he actually your dad didn't isn't that he got the um, the beehive. Anyway, um, yeah. So thanks. It's nice to be um, talking to real people. Also, welcome to the people who are um, online. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy to be sharing with you some. Um, results and some thoughts about work in the island of Puerto Rico, um, where I've spent a lot of time studying the plant diversity um, on the island. So just to to quickly introduce myself, I guess recap what Lena said. Um, I'm, a, I, I'm a tropical forest ecologist who's interested in kind of the interactions between human and nature. I've been here in Uppsala for the three, about three years. Um, pr before that, I was in Denmark at Aarhus University for four years, um, where I was in the eco-informatics and biodiversity section. Um, before that, I did a PhD in New York, where that's where I was started working in Puerto Rico. Um, but there's practically a subway line between New York City and Puerto Rico, so uh, it was kind of easy to get between the two places. So I spent a lot of time on the island during that period. But before that, I um, was I did a master's degree in the University of Miami, not studying plants at all. At that point, I was more interested in bats. Um, but they bite, and you have to stay up all night and everything. So that's what kind of one of the things that led me into into plants. but um, And then before that, I had spent a lot of time trying to use biology and my interest in research as a way to travel around and see the world, uh, working in different places, uh, mostly tropical areas, and studying different kinds of organisms. So anyways, that's a little bit about myself, minus all the stuff in between. Um, but um, of course, everything I'm going to talk about today is not just me. It's uh, a lot of people that contribute to that. So here's some more recent pictures of, of the group um, who contributes to this kind of this work. And um, also seeing that yesterday was International Women's Day, I want to take a second to recognize two uh, uh, really important Mentor, um, mentors in my career, Sabrina Russo uh, here drinking from a pitcher plant in Malaysia, uh, and Maria Uriarte, my PhD supervisor, who both were really, um, I mean, to say strong influences, to put it uh, mildly, on m the way I think about science and what I am, am doing still. Um, okay, so what I think a lot about and kind of like generally the work uh, going on in, in the group of people that I work with is thinking about patterns of diversity and patterns of variation. And we can think about a very different kind of spatial scales at a global scale. You can think about the forests that we have here in Sweden uh, and tropical forests and what kind of causes the variation across the globe and vegetation. You can think about it at a more regional scale, kind of as you go up an elevational gradient in a mountain, you see lots of different changes in the environment, lots of changes in the biological communities there. 
Um, and you can think about it at very local scales, even within a single forest stand when you're under the canopy, you can see variation in the light environment and other kinds of conditions that um, mediate the, the, the biological community that, finds, that you find there. So the general question that we are interested in is how does environmental heterogeneity mediate diversity and dynamics of plant communities or just biological communities in general um, across different kinds of spatial scales, different temporal scales. And um, tonight, and in mostly kind of the, the area, the, the specific place where we study that is in the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico that you can see here. Um, it's, it's not all that big. Um, if you compare it to the country of Sweden, it's about 2% um, of the land area. So this is an approximate um, scale. Um, but it is incredibly diverse. Um, here's a few pictures of the kinds of landscapes and uh, vegetation communities you can find on the island. And I'll talk more about, about these different uh, pictures as we go on. But um, for such a small area, it's quite uh, incredibly diverse. And that is a result of the, at least partly, is a, um, the high amount of environmental heterogeneity that you see on the island. So what do I mean by environmental heterogeneity in this sense? Um, well, let's start with just kind of the surface of the land itself. So here's the island, and it's shaded by the um, elevation. So you can see it has a very rugged topography. And you can see that in the picture of this. This is El Junque Mountain, which is over in the northeast part of the island. And you can, you can see the um, topographic heterogeneity. And then at also very local scales, you can see kind of uh, in this map uh, on, the, on the right there, you see kind of um, one part of this mountain. You can see lots of rugged terrain. And that mediates all kinds of things in terms of the uh, hydrological dynamics of the, uh, um, of the ground and uh, solar radiation. Lots of different factors are associated with that topographic heterogeneity. Um, it's also related to variation in the soil conditions. So um, to kind of simplify matters, sometimes I, th I usually think about maps of the soil, the geological substrate are very broad categories of soil parent material. And even if we think in very broad types of soils, the island has very diverse soil. So we have uh, the black and the gray are volcanically derived soils. The red are limestone and the, and, and the, the kind of beige and, and red are um, uh, limestone and sediment soils. And then there's also serpentine soils. And for those of you who know more about soils, which is not myself, but if you talk about soil orders and kind of the taxonomy of soil classifications, this is what the map looks like. And, and you can see it's incredibly diverse with different soil types on the island. Um, again, for, the, for those who think about orders, uh, the soil taxonomy, there's 12 kind of orders of soil. And the island has at least 10 of those represented. Um, so incredible edaphic diversity as well as topographic heterogeneity. Um, and I haven't even talked about climate yet. So this is a picture of mean annual precipitation. And you can see that there's quite a uh, variation that's also related to um, elevation. But in, here in the northeastern mountains, it's this dark blue which um, and down here in the in the south coast, it's yellow, and that corresponds, if you think about basketball, uh, about like more or less about a half of a LeBron James compared to about two LeBron Jameses uh, of of water coming down per year on average. The first year that I was working in in El Junque, it was actually more like six meters of rain in that year, so it's very wet. Um, and and quite dry here, especially when you consider the soil type. But we'll get into that. Um, and of course, that that 
um, is important for plants, these, these sources of variation. And you can go, as you might imagine, you can go between these two places. If you have a car, you can probably make it in about three hours drive. And you can see forest types that differ like this. So subtropical dry forests in the south coast, um, very kind of um, high stem density. There's, a, there's some very big kind of succulent trees, um, but lower canopy open compared to the sort of typical um, wet rainforest in the mountains. And a lot of di uh, variation in species composition, of course, as you go across. Um, so there's also high plant diversity. Um, it, I mean, I'm talking about these climatic zones, but um, all across the whole island, we have quite di high diversity of plants. Uh, this is just showing a phylogeny of of woody trees on the island. So there's about 600 species of trees on the island, uh, representing about eight, uh, 87 different families. And um, that's just talking about the trees. Um, so another kind of thing about the island of Puerto Rico is that it's got all of this environmental heterogeneity. It's got a high diversity of plants. And the diversity of plants is also very well documented and characterized, which is pretty cool um, to, to be able to use. So these are just some of the books that, that talk about the flora of the island. Um, and that's a, a great resource when you're doing research at the, on the island. Um, OK, so in terms of sort of overall patterns of diversity of plants. Here is a, pic uh, a map again of the Greater Antilles, Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is the smallest uh, island of the Greater Antilles just behind Jamaica. Um, and again, it's, it's about 2% the land area of Sweden. So just to kind of, if that helps the mental scale. Um, and if you think about the diversity, this is a table talking about vascular plant diversity in the Greater Antilles. And you can see Puerto Rico is, is highlighted there. So in turn, it's, there's over 3,000 species of vascular plants on the island, um, whereas Jamaica is a little bit larger, a little bit lower species diversity. Um, one thing that's pretty striking is the percentage of species that are endemic to each island. So Puerto Rico has about 8% of the species are only found on the island of Puerto Rico, whereas uh, Jamaica has 20, a, a quarter of the species of vascular plants uh, on Jamaica are uh, only found in Jamaica. And it goes up even higher for Hispaniola and Cuba. Cuba, almost half of the species on the island are endemic to the island. Um, so to me, there's a question mark there. Why is that? I mean, it is a little bit smaller, but um, it's quite a dramatic drop of endemism for the island. Um, anyways, it may, it, yeah, well, we can talk more about that, but that's a, that's a kind of a curious thing. But nonetheless, um, it's quite a high, oops, um, quite a high diversity for a small area. Um, and for those of you who are interested in kind of wha what are the most diverse families on the island, this table lays that out a little bit in terms of um, monocots, grasses, and orchids are very diverse. Um, there's the legumes and asteraceae are, are the most diverse dicot families. And there's a lot of ferns as well. Um, yes. and. There's also a very high diversity of fried foods on the island, um, but I don't have that. That's, that's just kind of um, research that's yet to be really documented in a formal way. So you can imagine that um, this is not about environmental heter heterogeneity, but I'm kind of mixing uh, just, just features of the island here. So the other thing that's nice about um, about working in the island of Puerto Rico is that there's lots of data, as you can see what I'm already showing you, is that there's a lot of information and knowledge about the, the place and about the biology of the organisms there that makes it um, kind of a nice atmosphere for, 
for doing research. And that's, you know, thanks to the various organizations and universities and institutes that are based there and the people um, that actually spend the time and energy to do the work there. So um, it's, yeah, that's the um, lot to, to build on in terms of what's going on there. So now, um, you know, I've talked about topography, soils, a, li a little bit about these things, climate. Um, and I'm going to tell you already that there's some sources of environmental heterogeneity that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, and maybe you already have anticipated something. Well, when is he going to talk about some something else? So keep it in your mind as a question, or maybe try and answer the question, what other sources of environmental heterogeneity might there be that are important for the communities on the island? Um, and I'll reveal that through a, uh, a tale of the history of the island. And so if we go back to El Junque Mountain, uh, which is again kind of up here in the northeast corner of the island, and if you find yourself walking through this forest, um, it will look something like this. And as you're going along, you may see a plant and it would it may you may find this plant here that is fruiting and it's making these these berries that turn from green to red. Does anybody know what plant this is? Yeah, coffee. This is coffee um, described by our very own Linnaeus. Um, uh, but you, does it, you know that coffee isn't native to the Caribbean. Um, this, this species is not native to the, to the island. So um, what's it doing? And because this, otherwise this forest looks like a pristine uh, r tropical rainforest, right? Um, and you wouldn't, it, you wouldn't necessarily expect that there had been any kind of human impact of this area in the past. Um, but in fact, uh, that same forest may have looked something like this uh, even 80 or maybe even less years ago, um, which was a coffee plantation, potentially a shade coffee plantation. So there was they were growing a lot of coffee in this area um, really not that long ago. Uh, and the more you kind of go around the island and look with you, with that in mind, you see more and more signals of this past land use. In this case, it's fairly obvious. You know, you have these pastures. Uh, the tree, the forest is not just naturally distributed like this. This is this is human land use, right? You see roads, you see pastures, um, you see even buildings in the corner. So. Let's go back in time a little bit to think about what is going on here. Um, you know, this is a map. Uh, well, I don't remember exactly the year for that, but this is an old map of the Caribbean. And just to point out, that's that's what people thought it looked like at the time. Um, and we're going to Caribbean. Uh, we're going to Puerto Rico um, four thousand years ago. This is when humans are first thought to have colonized the island, um, and it was. Uh, various indigenous groups and it, about a thousand years ago that it was the uh, Taino culture that was inhabiting the island and um, thriving there. Uh, so these are some representations about what the their kind of communities might have looked like and there are still artifacts that you can find of their civilization from from that time. Um, but then in 1493 the Spanish arrived uh, on the island, and of course they were looking for gold, uh, and they found some. They found some gold on the island, but they they didn't find that much. But they found other resources. They found um, a lot of um, a lot of people there to exploit, uh, and they found timber that was valuable to use for various purposes. And they found a climate and a landscape and a labor source of labor that was useful for producing various crops that they cared a lot about and that were very valuable. Um, and so that, that, um, di that was happening there for um, quite some time as the Spanish were, that we're talking 500 years ago. Uh, and they, they were um, inhabiting the island and kind of, uh, yeah, colonizing it for, for that period. And they built forts and d defended the island. Here's one fort, the, the Spanish fort you can still go and visit today. 
Um, but then in 1898, there was the Spanish-American War. This is like a rapid-fire history lesson, right? So um, we're going through um, centuries in the blink of an eye, but it, um, at, here's a painting of uh, the bombardment of this fort at, um, at, uh, in 1898. And at, at the end of this, the conclusion of this war, the United States took control of the island of Puerto Rico. And at that time, um, these are some pictures from the early 1900s um, where they're farming quite a lot of tobacco, sugarcane, and also coffee in the mountains. So there's this uh, very uh, predominantly um, cash crop agriculture around on the island. And you can see it also in the artworks of, that are being produced during this period. So these are two paintings from Puerto Rican artists um, from 1905 and then from 1941. And they're repre representing these, um, these kind of mythological figures, the, the Hibero, who's kind of like the, the farmer of the land, the land worker. Um, but what I want you to kind of focus on is the backgrounds of those, photo of those paintings and that the landscape, even in the distance here, um, it's the only trees you see, the only land cover you see is some, some coconut palms, some palm trees, um, but everything else is cleared for agriculture, right? Um, and that was the situation. So here are some photographs from the mid 1900s, uh, the kind of lives people were living in, uh, in their agricultural lifestyles and the, what it looked like um, looking towards, uh, from around San Juan area, uh, towards El Junque Mountain, you can see it's just kind of like uh, agricultural fields uh, the whole way along. So um, then what happened? So in the, after World War II, um, and this is, you know, there's several talks that could kind of come, be, I'm, I'm skipping over the content of several talks, but after World War II, uh, what happened was that the United States government um, in, they, they initiated this major development program that they called Operation Bootstrap. And this was, that, the idea here was um, uh, partly to help the Puerto Rican people transition from the agricultural economy to an industrialized economy. Um, also, of course, there's geopolitical and strategic reasons that the, the United States government wants to kind of keep a foothold in the region. But anyways, they did this whole program um, to basically an incentivize companies to move to the Puerto Rico and move the labor source from the agricultural sector to the industrial sector. And it was really effective. So here is the um, number of agricultural jobs in blue and green shows manufacturing jobs going from 1940 to 1970. And you see just like um, a tr that transition. So people were moving um, into manufacturing and that means leaving the, their jobs in the countryside, farming, and moving into the urban centers. And when you do that anywhere really, but especially in the tropics, when you abandon land, the vegetation takes over and it happens pretty fast. So here, this is a picture, these are pictures from Mexico, um, but the same kind of thing you can see in Puerto Rico. These are uh, corn, field, corn fields where they were growing corn. Uh, but they had just been abandoned that year. Uh, and then three years later, they were looking like that. So this is, and nobody planted any vegetation. This is just natural, uh, natural regeneration of forests on these lands. So for Puerto Rico, what happened from 1950 going up to, in this figure it shows to the year 2000, we see um, the, the amount of land area of the island that was covered in forest back in 1950 was down to something around 20%. But then in y the year 2000, because of this agricultural abandonment, it went up to more like 50%. And now it's even closer to 60%. So, um, and meanwhile, the agricultural, the amount of land going to agricultural crops dropped, um, pasture has, kind of been around the same and urban areas have expanded. So when I'm talking about another source of environmental heterogeneity on the island, um, one thing that I'm talking about is, is this human land use history. 
Uh, and we can look at it in one way of like how old are the forests on the island. So we see now 60% of the island is covered in forest, but it's of different ages. Some of it is very old in terms of like older than what, um, more than 100 years old probably, uh, if not more. And some of it is quite, is quite new because of this process of land abandonment. Okay. Um, so yeah, now, um, but like I said, now you see quite a, a lot of the island is, is forested. And so one thing that has really been striking to me as I learned about this whole process is that although you've, there's been this huge contraction of forested area on the island and now an expansion of it, as far as the botanists, that there's no records of local extinctions of plant species on the island which to me is just, cr it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's shocking. Like, how can you have this contraction of habitat and then expansion again? And again, the botany has been well documented for centuries. So it's sure, maybe some things have been missed, but it's, it's pretty astonishing that there's no uh, records of local plant extinctions. I put an asterisk there because maybe there's some, maybe there's one or two, but it's not uh, not much, right? Um, so that is like the seed that generated an idea for a proposal, of a project that's that's going on now. Laura is here. Uh, this is this is um, a project that's kind of just getting underway with Laura, a PhD student, and Pascal, also in the same department over at Uppsala University, where we're looking at. Um, the population genetic consequences of this land use change on uh, trees in Puerto Rico. Um, yeah, so more on that. Laura will probably come back to tell more about that once she does, has a little bit more time to dig into it. So stay tuned. Um, but, okay, so let's come back to this. Here is just kind of aggregated agricultural land area on the island from early 1900s to uh, late 1900s, a huge drop, but of course um, population didn't follow the same same trend. So you see here we had uh, there was an increase of population from one to about four million of people living on the island uh, during that same period. But what you see at the end here is there's actually like it doesn't it it kind of ticks down there and there in the last between the last two censuses. Uh, between 2000 and 2020, there was a 4% decline in the population on the island, which is kind of curious, right? So do you think it has anything to do with environmental heterogeneity? Probably. Um, so, but what is another source of environmental heterogeneity that might explain these dynamics of population on the island? Um, anybody want to wager a guess? hurricanes from the audience and in fact um yes we uh um we have hurricanes in in the caribbean region right like in many places this is a picture a satellite picture of hurricane maria in 2017 and if you can't see you can't tell kind of how big it is there's the island of puerto rico um uh, so it's a massive category five hurricane that that hit in um september of 2017 and of of course, you can imagine that the um, destruction and impact on both the sort of uh, biological communities and the human systems and, hu and humans on the island were extreme. Uh, and this is not a talk about anything about the, the impact on, on human uh, systems here, but um, it was uh, e extremely uh, impact well, i mean what do you it was an extreme event had a big impacts on on these systems um here are some pictures from just just after the hurricane um from this is from el junque forest so it's it's basically in the same place where we were standing in the in the coffee plantation before uh, so this was a closed completely closed canopy forest where really typically it's totally light limited the understory, you're, it's it's dark and things are just waiting for some light to grow. Um, but this is what it looked like shortly after. Um, here's some other views. You can see how much material has just moved from the canopy onto the ground, how much 
more openness there is in the canopy um and you can find lots of pictures along these lines but you the the effect is dramatic right um and, and it's not something new you know it's not like that was the first time that ever happened hurricanes are a fact of life in that part of the world as in many others this is a map of hurricane tracks going back to the mid 1800s in the north atlantic so um puerto rico is is under this mess of um of hurricane tracks so it's not something new for the island um and in fact you you might even guess that when you kind of see how how the forest responds to these disturbances so this is a picture um, from shortly after the hurricane and you can see like it is quite open but you see a lot of growth and if you look down it's just green it looks like a thriving um, vegetation even though you see these kind of weird sticks that with uh, broken tops um, and then here's a series of pictures that sam has taken from the same perspective in the lukio forest um, going over a 30-month period following that hurricane and you can also get an appreciation for how quick the regeneration is of vegetation in these in this place so vegetation kind of recovers in a certain a way really really quickly and part of that is driven by like growth rates of individual plants right so here this is a figure from a, a paper about uh, vegetation response in um, to a hurricane in in jamaica so this is in a different site but also hurricane gilbert was another large hurricane from in 1988 and this group had been studying growth rates of trees uh, in this forest before that hurricane and then they kept tracking growth rates after and in here they split that into trees that suffered a lot of damage from hurricane gilbert and other trees that didn't suffer that much damage and you can see um, before the hurricane here's kind of average growth rates down here then there's the hurricane and you can see here this is if you're an undamaged tree after the hurricane your growth rate just tripled uh, and even if you got damaged in the hurricane you still had a doubling of your growth rate um, and it, it the crazy thing is that it even persisted. I mean, this is going from 1988 to 2009. So it was decades after, the dist after that hurricane, the growth rates are higher than they were before the hurricane still. So um, y this is part of, part of the process that's driving that r rapid response and rapid recovery for hurricanes. So this has kind of like spurred this question about how do, how do trees actually achieve that po that high those high growth rates? How what's the mechanism by which they're able to to do that? Um, so when we think about tree growth and the processes that that govern that, we you know we're talking about plant physiology. So we go back to your plant physiology uh, basics and think about the plant as this kind of more or less like an electrical system of things like flowing in and out it's trying to get light it's moving water to do different chemical processes and um, the the kind of the plumbing of the plant that controls the water the movement of water through the plant um, is in, in the wood and in the leaves and everything else but i'm going to talk about the wood um, so we can think about the anatomical structures in the wood as they're the they are kind of the plumbing of the wood and uh, and other things too but um if we are interested in tree growth and we need to get water from the soil into the leaves in order for the leaves to do photosynthesis and for the tree to grow um we might ex we, we we wonder is there some way that plants uh, these trees can somehow like adjust their anatomical structure in order to promote that um, rapid growth and we see a lot of variation between species of trees in their in terms of their an anatomical structures that is related to growth rates so these are two species from from the area in puerto rico 
Uh, some that are, this is a very fast growing species. Typically, this is a slower growing species, and you see m big differences. So that w that was the question that kind of led into this project uh, about do trees kind of um, somehow adjust their wood anatomy or is, does wood anatomy change uh, in a way that allows trees to capitalize on these sort of high resource conditions after a disturbance. So when the canopy gets opened from a hurricane, do trees start producing wood that is of a different quality that allows them to grow very quickly? Uh, this And so this is work really Kasia, Kasia Zeminska um, was a postdoc in the group that was doing a lot of this work. Sylvia Bubo, a technician, and Sam Farrar, another PhD student, have been uh, working a lot on this project. So what we did was go to the uh, Lukio forest in, in the northeast mountains of the island. Um, and this is a place, there's one forest plot there that's 16 hectares. So it's this is the Lukio forest dynamics plot, 500 meter by 320 meter parcel of land in the forest where every individual tree that's one centimeter diameter or bigger has been tagged like this, identified to the species, mapped, measured about every five years for the past 35 years. So there's this long-term data set about tree growth. So we, we took that data set and we identified um, which trees had uh, oh, I guess I need to mention really quick, some of the trees in here, not all of them, but some of them also have these metal dendrometers. So this is basically just this metal band that goes around the trunk. And as the trunk ex grows and expands, you can measure, there's a little notch kind of here, and that you measure that notch. And so you, th that's how we keep track of the growth of the, of the tree. Um, so we use that data to select individual trees that did exhibit this high increase of growth rates from the pre before the hurricane to after the hurricane so this is a figure sh each line in this figure shows a different individual tree and the starting point of the line is the the growth rate during the pre-hurricane period and the end of the line to to the left side or to your right side is the growth rate at the post-hurricane period, uh, time, uh, after the hurricane, that's how fast the tree was growing. So we went and we selected the individual trees that had the, the most highest increases of growth rates because we wanted to see what, how do they do that? Is there some variation in their anatomy that allows them to do that? So we identified which individuals those were, and then we, and by we here, it means Sam, um, went out to the forest and found those trees. Oops. Then he um, took a core. He took, used a, 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 a increment borer to extract a core from these trees. Um, and then he took them to the lab and Kasha also and sectioned them to make a thin cross section of the wood. We took them to another lab over here in Uppsala and put this, uh, them in this machine that scanned these slides. And we come out with images that look like this. And then we went through a process to digitize that and annotate those so we could then um, characterize a lot of different traits or characteristics of, those, uh, of these samples about how the size of the, the vessels that tra actually transport the water, uh, estimates of how much the uh, measurement of uh, hydraulic conductivity, how grouped are the different vessel or uh, different indices that indicate how much grouping there is between vessels, various parameters that we don't need to go into in depth, but if anybody wants to talk more about it, we can. But we used that to estimate these traits. Um, and then we, we took those annotated images. We had like the end, the, this is looking at the outside of the tree going down into the center of the tree and this is essentially a record of time right so as the tree grows if you drill into the tree you're looking back in time so we used the data we had on growth rates to estimate where in the sample was what wood was being produced at the time when the hurricane hit and so we could and that's what this line represents and so then we could separate out the 
the features on either side of this and say, what was it like before the hurricane? What was it like after the hurricane? And we did various analyses to this, which um, we can talk more about. But what I'm going to tell you about a little bit is just just simply define, we defined kind of a pre-hurricane period and a post-hurricane period, and we, comp we compared the anatomy of the wood between those two times. Okay, so here's another figure, kind of like the growth one that I showed before. But e so each line is showing a, an individual tree, and it shows what, in this case, this measurement of potential hydraulic conductivity. So this is an estimate of basically how much water through the stem at any given time. Um, how that value before the hurricane and in the wood after the hurricane. And now when you look at it like this, you see all the different, each color is a different species. And so this looks like kind of a mess of lines going all over the place. Um, but if you really squint, and I guess if you want, I can tell you about the statistics if you want, but in the, the, in the end, we do see um, well, one thing we see is that there's a lot of variation, right? So there's a lot of variation both between species um, as well as within species in terms of both their, how much the, the values of the, this characteristic, both in any given time point, but also their response to their hurricane. We see a lot of variation between species. Um, but Overall, there is, if you squint uh, and do the statistics on it, you see that there is an increase in general of um, potential hydraulic conductivity in the wood produced after the hurricane. Um, and it's not true for every individual tree, but that's the general pattern. So we have some evidence um, that these higher growth rates are facilitated by changes in the anatomical structure that allow more water to move and um, increase the growth rate. And, um, you know, this, as we kind of were doing this work and looking at this, these structures of wood and thinking about this variation between species and within species, it opens up a lot of other questions besides just how species respond to the hurricane. But um, there's plenty more to dig into here. And really, this is work that Sam is, di is, is doing for his PhD thesis, um, wh which is really digging into that variation in wood anatomy. And so here you see a couple examples of two different species that occur in different forests on the island. Uh, here's Tababuya heterophylla, who, that occurs both in the very dry forest and the very wet forest. And you can see just um, differences visually in, in the structure of the wood of trees, of examples of trees from those two different places. Uh, and another species, Bursera simaruba, who, who grows in the very dry places and in the moist forest. So you see um, w that's, that's Sam's work that he'll come back and talk to you more about as he gets further along with it. Um, so the question there is about how wood anatomy varies across species ranges and across environmental conditions. And of course, we're also really interested in what is the functional kind of consequence of this variation. And so this is another aspect of Sam's work where um, without going into any of the details, he's looking at how these wood anatomical traits are linked with hydraulic function um, and ultimately vulnerability of the trees to drought. Yes. Um, OK, so uh, I talked about environmental heterogeneity on the island of Puerto Rico and um, showed you some ways that it affects the plant communities. And I think one of the kind of take home messages I want to say is just that when we talk about environmental heterogeneity, it's both um, sources of sort of what we might call uh, natural variation of abiotic conditions, but it's also driven by disturbances that can be created by humans um, and also that aren't created by humans. So we can't forget about the role of both anthropogenic and non-anthropogenic disturbance as a source of environmental heterogeneity. And it's very apparent in this place. So I will leave it with at that. And uh, thanks for listening, and uh, thanks to these people for participating in all this. 
And I'm happy to have questions or discussion with anybody. Okay, so I have the microphone in case someone wants to ask a question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks for a, a good talk, Bob. That's really interesting. So one of the advantages of the forest dynamics plot is it is 35 years of data. And there have been multiple hurricanes that have hit the forest and the plot in that time. And I'm curious because we're seeing it, perhaps an increase in frequency and intensity of hurricanes. If there's any evidence for how the trees can respond repeatedly, right? And it's one thing to say, well, you get a hurricane every 20 years or 30 years, and this is a positive response. But when they start coming every two years or three years, and you've had you had another one since since the 2017 hurricane, right? Has there been another Not a one? major one, no. Not yeah. a major one. Okay. Yeah, but, but still. But still, yeah. So yeah. it's I'm curious about if you're seeing anything or able to see anything that way yet. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a great question and, and super important because that's the that's the trend is the prediction is having more and more intense, uh, more frequent and more intense hurricanes. So um yeah, so we haven't looked at that directly, but I mean, but we we think about, I mean, just to have a picture of something like this to look at. I mean, I'm talking about um, mostly about the hydraulic architecture in, in this presentation, but there's other stuff going on in terms of like other resource, like the carb non-structural carbohydrates and the parenchyma and the wood. And whether that, that's, to me, that's a big question. After one hurricane, that's one thing we're, we're digging into is whether the tree sort of mobilizes carbohydrates that are in the parenchyma to, to, re, um, to rebuild. And then it may, is it depleted at that point to where it's maybe more vulnerable to another hurricane or, or also maybe to drought? So it's not just it's it, it's also not about not just about um, repeat hurricanes and kind of like what's the interval for recovery, but also other disturbance types. So I, I one thing that w w yeah we're working on is um, what is the impact or what's what would really be the effect of this kind of anatomical response if then you're kind of sl slammed with a drought. Or another hurricane. So I mean, it's yeah. That's um, I think that that's in general these kind of compound and and compound disturbances or interactive disturbances is something we have to think more about. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank. Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm I'm curious about this. Uh, the, you mentioned that you hadn't had any uh, kind of um, uh, local disappearances of, of species or local or local, but, and I wonder if anyone has investigated if that is connected to these extreme events of disturbances. I mean, so, so that because they, they are very resilient those species that you have on yeah so this is Caribbean. a really interesting kind of idea that um so there's one um researcher aria lugo who's just a, he, he's the he's the expert of these forests and uh, he has this idea that that because of this sort of history of hurricane disturbance on the island that the vegetation has developed this kind of resilience that maybe makes them able to somehow withstand these human impacts as well um to me it's still like i don't i'm, I'm not really sure what is the mechanism there like how how does that actually work um but i mean it, it it's yeah it's an it's an interesting idea that maybe they kind of are you know, in a way, pre-adapted to um, deal with human impacts by this history of disturbance. So, yeah, it's it's something to yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point. 
but I don't know what would be the actual like how it would how it would really work, you know. Um, but another question related to hurricanes: Has anyone tried to uh, kind of model backwards in time for how long these frequent? I mean. It, if it has uh, frequent hurricanes have been for millions of years or uh, i'm not aware of that um for kind of that kind of deep time estimates of hurricane frequency um i know i mean for this this picture that i showed with all of the lines of the hurricane um this is basically generate it because this goes back to 1851 so this is obviously pre-satellite data and stuff like that. so this is actually from ship logs they reconstructed it from boats that were they would record when storms are going along and so for the earlier ones they they took it from those ship logs um but going earlier than that i'm really not sure about efforts to do that i don't know do you know um has something with the closing of South and North America or something like that, that, that after that hurricanes started because of the Mexican Gulf. And yeah, so. I, I mean, most of them are formed farther, like sort of get started yeah. farther to the east. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. That's a, it would be interesting to know kind of when that pattern started. Yeah. So I have a question. One of the pictures you showed, there were only palm trees basically left. Yeah. Uh, so a different, list, different species uh, affected differently. I mean, uh, of course they are, but uh, the recovery rate, is it different for different species? I mean, is it also the same very high for the, I guess it's coconut palm or something like that? Or... No, it's not coconut. Okay. Uh, it's, yeah. But do these like gain an advantage because they are still standing quite tall or and then they close the canopy or is it like the ones that grow really fast or the small understory plants that come up? Um, yeah, so species definitely vary in terms of both their susceptibility to damage um, and mortality from the storm and also their their say mode of recovery and and speed of recovery. Um, so this particular picture is from an area that is it, it's typically dominated by palms so it's not that everything else is already knocked over this even before this was mostly palms uh anyways but you c but even in the picture from a lower this is another site where um this has a, a much more mixed for palms in this area are are one of the dominant species but um this is from a more mixed forest and you can see obviously like palms th because they don't branch they have kind of less to lose, right? So a few leaves get knocked off and they're much quicker. For for one thing, their trunks very flexible and kind of can, they have less resistance to the wind, so they suffer less breakage. Um, plus then they're kind of what they lose in terms of nutrients out of the canopy um, is relatively minimal. So they recover very quickly. And it's actually one in this, this island and there are other places in the world that are dominated by palms and they're subject to these kind of frequent wind disturbances and it's one i, I mean i it's it's one hypothesis about what drives palm abundance patterns is about this disturbance regime um, so palms are particularly interesting for this but then if you think about other species um, there is a huge amount of variation in term, and it has to do with their growth forms, with the actual physical kind of properties of the wood. Um, yeah. So we're trying to use the wood anatomy to kind of tie some of those things together because the an anatomy tells us a lot about the structural, the strength and the rigidity of the trees, but potentially it can also tell us about uh, like this, this um, mobilization of non-structural carbohydrates to to re-sprout kind of a lot of these trees that survive they they re-sprout vegetation and that kind of how how quickly can they, they do that what are the different strategies for for re-sprouting um we're we're using the wood anatomy to try and learn more about that
a question. They said that they were only like 8% uh, endemic or something like that on Puerto Rico. Do you know if the other species, are they more similar or are they shared with the like Cuba and other islands or is it more to the Caribbean or where is it like the overlapping with the species? Is it more to uh, the eastern side or the western side? Or, I mean, I'm... I can't say like actually quantitatively about that uh, off the top of my head. Um, but the thing is that the, let's see if we go back to map towards the beginning. Um, I mean, the, so these, these are the greater Antilles uh, and they're called that cause they're big. And then these are called the lesser Antilles because they're small. And so you just generally have a lot higher diversity on the greater Antilles that uh, you would imagine kind of the, the bulk of species would also occur there. Um, but the, the prevailing winds are from the east to the west. So I mean, dispersal is um, definitely biased in this direction. Um, so those are that's what I can sort of say about it, but I don't really, ac I don't actually know in terms of like which w unique species, which side kind of has more. Yeah. Again, about uh, endemic, endemism. Uh, do you know anything about the serpentine rocks? If there are, there's a lot of endemism. There's quite a lot. So the endemics on the on the island are mostly um, are mostly e either in the serpentine, yeah. which is this kind of just weird soil type that or bedrock material that um, is has a ver relatively small area on the island, yeah. but there's endemics there. Um, and then the other ones are on the mountain peaks. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one reason for the lower percentage of endemics in Puerto Rico compared to Jamaica is just that there's the mountains are not as tall. Mm. Um, but I, I don't know if that really explains everything about the lower level of endemism or not, but, um, but yeah. yeah. So any other questions? Otherwise, uh, thank you very much, Bob. Yeah. And uh, we have coffee and uh, fika over there on the table. And um, I guess we can continue asking you questions afterwards. Yeah. Were there any questions from the online, actually? Did we? No. no. Questions. Okay. So, uh, I'm very excited here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, 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 he was uh, one of my postdoc advisors. Yeah, yeah, I, he's great. <laughs> he's a little bit crazy, yeah, but in a good way. <laughs> yeah. So should I, are we, should I turn? Okay. <laughs>